real gem and go like that with your hands. Very graceful, very, very pretty. To capture those special feelings. How to achieve images that result in beautiful wall portraits that your clients will always treasure. In a whole new light, we'll show you how to create your own success story and realize your dreams. Our next location has a much more formal feel to it. It's a beautiful 135-year-old orphanage with four acres of grounds and beautiful Spanish architecture. It's a much more closed-in area, one in which the light comes from many different directions depending on the view chosen. You'll also notice that the symbols are vastly different than the wooded pasture that we just left. But the strategy is still the same. Find the lines, the light, analyze the symbols and the textures and the shapes, strive to create depth and dimension, and then match the mood to the subject that we're going to use. Let's go for a walk and find some backgrounds and some feelings. One thing you'll notice in a man-made environment is the repetition of lines and shapes, such as these stone pavers and beautiful archways and wall surfaces. This is different than the random lines and shapes found in nature. You'll also notice that the surfaces are hard and rigid. The solidness and shape of the stone symbolize strength, dependability, and classicism. The color of the walls softens the effect, making it appear more gentle and friendly than if the walls were gray or black. It feels friendly. The effect is heightened by the delicately leafed and softly rounded plantings in the landscape. The overall feeling is that people are welcome here, as if stories have unfolded here, real things that happen to real people. There is a storytelling quality to this location. Because of the massive stonework, an effective tool to use here is contrasting textures, playing opposites off of each other, soft against hard, temporal against eternal, or in the case of the photograph you'll see in a second, satin against stone. I like the storytelling quality of this photograph, especially the discovery of the two little girls peeking out from the balcony. It was the balcony that suggested the story. I envisioned the girls there looking out. Then all I needed was something for them to look at. The teacher, instructing the more advanced students, seemed like a natural occurrence if this was a ballet school. The varied pastels of their wardrobe contributed to the feeling of gracefulness and gentleness. The teacher in front, the small girls in back, give it depth. The light is indirect, blocked by the buildings and bouncing off of the walls. Always try to imagine a day in the life of the subjects you are portraying. Imagination makes great pictures happen. Another natural connection for a story for children would be water, in this case a fountain. Because of its size, I usually just show the lily pond area. Whenever in doubt, show less, simplify. There are many angles to view this fountain from. Notice that each shows something different. The angle I selected for the children's portrait I'm about to show you was chosen because of the soft, round, cascading lines of the area in the background. The light arch caught my eye, and since I like to have something light in the background to draw you further into it, I composed this image to include it. The lines all contribute to the graceful femininity of the little girls. The soft arch, the lines of the trees and bushes cascading down, repeated by the soft cascading lines of the girls themselves, help give the same feeling and mood. There is an art to capturing naturalness in children. Children's portraits have the power to captivate us more than any other type. Most effective portraits go beyond just showing the face. They tell a story. For now, let me take you to another storytelling scene and see what it suggests. What does this scene remind you of? To me, it's reminiscent of the towers so prevalent in many childhood fairy tales. 
This is a portrait of a brother and a sister, done at an age when there isn't a lot of positive interaction. The girl has her interests, the boy his. After reading some of the signals the pair were giving me, the don't touch me kind of stuff, I decided I would let that be the story. I placed them back to back, symbolizing separateness, turning the girl into the pretty light and ignoring her, letting her play with her doll. The boy I put into a position of withdrawal, folding him up, hugging his knees. I talked to him a bit, and I liked the pleading look that he gave me. He desperately wanted a brother to play with instead. The tower seemed to add the mystery that was needed here. It added to the complexity of the story, and because of its size, made the children look like small kids in an adult world. This particular scene was chosen because of the wonderful shapes and lines connecting both nature and architecture, fitting for the story I involved the girl in. The sky needed to be shown, but I didn't want it to overpower, so in considering a vertical or a horizontal view, I chose the horizontal because it cropped out the sky. It minimized the tower, so I made the foreground more the showpiece by using flowers and lace. She was encouraged to watch the birds because one might bring her a message. The light was twilight, after the sun had actually set, about a one-fifteenth of a second exposure, soft enough to illuminate her in the large background evenly. No reflectors were needed. I found it helpful in creating illustrative portraiture to try and first imagine a scenario unfolding before your eyes, like a mini scene from a play or a movie. This is a Romeo and Juliet balcony. It's not hard to imagine a beautiful girl walking up to the railing, looking longingly for her forbidden love. Balconies and romance seem to be inexorably linked together. This scene has the added bonus of a window in a romantic shape, repeating the symbol of romance and hope. Light coming through a window always symbolizes hope. The arches and the swirls say classical romance. A plain square window wouldn't have the same effect. Once you have photographed the subject from one angle, walk all the way around to the opposite side to see if any other ideas or inspirations come to mind. Interestingly enough, this same scene when viewed from the exact opposite viewpoint has a very different but equally effective look. Here the mood has changed dramatically because of the light. The light is forced to come from one side only and with little light to fill in on the camera side, the effect is fairly low-key and dramatic. This photograph was another offshoot of the Romeo and Juliet imagining, with Juliet sneaking off to a quiet corner to read a cherished note from her love. The more personality you can give your imagined subjects, the easier it will be to picture them doing things. Let's talk a minute about real-life stories and ways we might portray them. Take a look at this courtyard. It's a beautiful storytelling scene. There are so many different shapes and symbols and textures here. Let me explain a bit about what I saw here and what I chose to portray. Let's begin with a very simple linear background, the repeated rectangles of a rising staircase. Straight lines facing straight at the camera create a sense of dependability but are in reality rather boring. However, any straight line can be turned into a more dynamic diagonal simply by moving the camera off to one side and photographing at a slight angle. The steps in the photograph I'm about to show you serve three purposes. Number one, it provided a masculine orientation to the photo, which I knew was for the girl's father. Number two, it was an excellent platform for body language, as multi-level areas often are. And number three, it provided a symbol for a journey. Stairs, walkways and gates seem to say that there has been a journey from another spot or that there is something yet to happen. They are symbols of transition and arrival. In this particular photograph, the story is of a vibrant young girl who was working in Los Angeles as a dancer doing TV commercials and the like. She was burned out by the grind and was just thinking about moving back home and taking care of her mom who was ill. The smiling picture was very pretty, but the picture that seemed to tell her story was this. Here, the symbol of transition, the steps, 
supported the story by the removing of the shoes, which symbolized her giving up dancing for now. The little girl's body language, the crossing of the feet, said it was time to go home for a while. The tilt of the head downward, the downward gaze, says that this is a serious decision, a heartfelt emotion. If you're a willing listener, your subject will often reveal a story which you can symbolically portray. Let's take a look at the same scene from further away and in a different light. In this photograph, the steps are relegated to a background position and have a different feeling because they're rendered much lighter in tone. And being further away, the lines become less commanding. Now the eye goes primarily to the couple in the gate. The mood is of playfulness and romance. The swirling, delicate lines of the gate and the overall high key tonality of the picture supports the mood. The steps, in this case, seem to be a promise of future times. Here the steps are again given background position, but made even less demanding by placing them in the upper right corner. The arched tree in the foreground over the subjects gives us the feeling of nurturing and protection. The steps, a simple lead into the photo and provider of stability and depth. It's very important when selecting outdoor backgrounds to view each scene from a variety of camera heights and angles. When evaluating each position, ask yourself if everything included in the scene contributes. If it doesn't, simply eliminate it. For example, in the small walkway patch behind me, the brightness of that little area is very distracting because its luminescence is much brighter than the rest of the scene. To change that effect, simply portray it from a lower camera angle like this. From this position, the white area has been virtually eliminated and the gray lines become much more dominant. Remember that everything you include means something. So position contributing things to be important and distractions to be less important. Here's another rendition of the steps, this time as part of a moody scene photo, the subjects appearing small and fragile compared to the size and mass of the steps. Here we view the subjects anonymously from afar hidden by the distance. It's easy to picture the two walking down the steps, resting at the bottom, taking time out for a rest, perhaps to heal a hurt or share a hug. Here the stairs appear to be both a transitional element and a destination. We don't feel the need to see them go any farther. When you first walk upon a scene, the eye actually takes in about a 180 degree perspective. That's a lot of detail. One of the most attractive elements in our new scene is our new model, Regina. I usually try and block a shot by looking at it from the perspective of about a 127 or 150 millimeter lens on a two and a quarter camera. From that perspective, I am able to crop out a lot of the extraneous detail that I really don't want in the photograph, and it gives me a better chance to react to the symbols that are there. What I'd like you to experience firsthand is my thought process as I first walk onto a scene and begin to make some of these decisions. I'm gonna do this by actually putting the video camera on my shoulder and taking you a walk through the scene that way. The first thing I look for in a scene such as this are lines. And there are several lines that are happening in this particular scene. The strong line is along the garden path. From this particular viewpoint, it's straight line. I'm going to try and create a little bit more of a dynamic diagonal simply by moving the camera farther to the right. That does increase the strength of the diagonal, but my reaction to it is that the left wall behind her in the building becomes too powerful. So I then try and crop out that particular part by moving in just a little bit closer. From this point of view, it effectively isolates just the green and the brown rock. So I like that viewpoint better. I would then test it from a lower angle. And the lower angle makes the horizon line rise up behind her, isolating her face against the hillside. A higher angle brings the rock right to the point of her face, putting a darker space there instead of a lighter space. Next thing I'd want to check is by moving in closer to see if I cropped in on just the tight portrait what my effect would be. There we have just this beautiful face against the hard rock texture behind and the softer texture of the leaves to the left. And that's pretty. If I move to the right a little bit, notice how quickly that square shape comes into play. This is how fast the symbols can change in a photograph. 
I would want to move back over here because the symbol is a little rounder. The way that line leads down to her face is nice, and so I'm going to return back to that. And now notice how beautiful that cascading line becomes from the top of that balustrade as it just waves its way down the hillside right to her face. One of the things that bothers me a little bit is this branch right in here. Because there's no foliage on it, it's simply an unwanted line. I would do whatever I could to eliminate that from the scene. Perhaps by cropping we can eliminate that. I'm going to move it a little bit closer again. This is just changing lenses. What we're doing is isolating different parts of the photograph. Looking at the scene now from a storytelling point of view, I get a flashback from The Secret Garden, a book I used to read to my daughters. It spoke of an old, overgrown, mysterious garden, a perfect place for telling secrets and sharing dreams. But one last change needed to be made. The details that remain in this scene demand too much attention. There are imperfections in the stone wall and too many details in the grass and the hillside. So I finally view the scene with the diffused lens and bingo scene takes on the feeling of the remembered story. Here was the scenario. One, check the scene for adequate light. Two, notice the strongest lines. Three, notice the possible resting place. Four, a test of different views utilizing the strongest lines. Five, I notice the feeling the symbols shown were giving. Number six, I tested through the camera for a close-up effect to see if it improved. Number seven, I return to the best view to see if the feeling of the imagined scene fit. Number eight, I add a diffusion to subdue the details and add the mood. What we just did was view a scene not just from a left-brain technical consideration, but also from a right-brain point of view. What did the scene feel like? What feelings did the symbols seem to portray? What human emotions or stories might we connect to them? This approach helps us to connect the right scene with the right subject for more meaningful portrayals. Here's another scene from this courtyard designed around symbols. This is a portrait of a young girl, 13 or 14 years of age, done in the springtime when this tree is alive with beautiful white blossoms. The tree would be a very pretty background for almost anything feminine because of its soft texture and gentle color. I thought it to be a fitting scene to show the innocence and vulnerability of this young girl, making the stone wall make her look fragile and delicate, the fleeting blossoms of the tree echoed by the color of her gown, the shape and line of the tree echoed in her pose. Blossoms in springtime symbolize emergence and transition. This is a young girl blossoming, making the transition from girl to woman. The softness of the light echoes the softness of the mood and expression. Always attempt to match the mood to the picture and to the symbols portrayed, or vice versa. Here, the same background is used again, putting a lot of space around the subject, which this time is a young child three or four years old. The mood is lighter, more playful, frivolous, typified by her body language and expression. The tall, thin cropping is keyed around the shape of the wall opening but supports the light, delicate feel of the picture. So the cropping and shape of the final piece can have a symbolic contribution as well. In this photo, the little girl is in a scene with a pretty foreground, but with a background that goes dead, an unwelcoming symbol of darkness. Notice the change of feeling here, where there is a wonderful warm light to draw you deeper into the scene. Here the light is symbol of playfulness and promise, much more fitting for this little girl. This scene is very attractive for a number of reasons. One of them is Kelly. <laughs> the other is the beautiful archway that she's standing in and the beautiful way that that foliage echoes the shape of the arch. Also, I love the beautiful pastel colors involved here and the sense of depth and dimension in this background. The problem is there is very little light coming in from the front. There is, however, beautiful backlight. If I turn the face to profile, the backlight will skim across the face and create a beautiful Rembrandt triangle on the cheek. This is what it looks like with a flat frontal light. And this is what a beautiful sculpted light looks like. For a normal key photograph, we are limited to a profile pose, or we can add strobe or reflected light. But I want to show you another alternative. 
It's called stepping up to a higher key. Kelly, let me get you to move over to this little wall. In stepping up to a higher key, the exposure is made in the dim light area. The reading I'm getting here is approximately F4. If I took a reading for the background, getting a reading of F8. Now, once we expose for the front light, you'll see that the background, it becomes overexposed and automatically goes up to a higher key, just as you're seeing here. Let me demonstrate that again. This is the dimmer light just in the front, where the background becomes the normal exposure, the face is deeper, and this is the example of the higher key effect as we open up for the light on the face. You may have noticed that most of the portraits we've shown so far have been full-length portraits. Let's concentrate for a little bit on finding backgrounds for head and shoulder and three-quarter length portraits. On a medium format camera, I'm going to be using a 180 millimeter lens. This shows a much thinner angle. It's much easier to find a background with this kind of lens. Let's consider this hallway for a moment very solid, very linear, very organized. The rough texture and rectangular form suggest a masculine background. And since we have a masculine model, Daniel, let's proceed to do some portraits. All right, Daniel, I'll tell you what. I'm gonna just turn your body this way a tiny little bit. And the one thing I'm gonna change, keep that weight the way it was before we had it shifted that way. Let's just tuck this hand down inside here and then just turn your face towards the light over there. That's great looks great, real strong. And we have that beautiful cross light which is coming across. The uh, low key effect is very masculine. The way the light crosses the face, sculpting the face, is wonderful cheekbones, so it's very easy face to light. Daniel, just the eyes a tiny bit closer to the camera, a little bit closer to me. That's very good. All right, turn your face even farther that way this time. Very good. All right. I'm going to change the pose just a little bit. For this one, let's take the hands and just put them in the pants pockets. And perhaps I'm going to lean you in front of this bar just a little bit farther that way. You can even cross the foot across there if it's comfortable for you. That's good. All right, looks real good. Just straight back at me. That's very good. All right. You can look straight back towards me. Took the top of your head a little bit this way and the eyes right about where my hand is, right here. That's very good. All right, you got it. All right, one, one more little change. Take the hands and just put them back in the pockets this way and spread your feet farther apart. This gives a little more solid feel to that. And then turn your face back into that lighting. All right, that looks great. You're looking great. Here we go. All right, we got it. Beautiful. All right, we got it. Let's break. Let's move to another spot farther down. What we've got here is just a different tone of background, a deeper gray and the solid form is just a little stronger look. So we're just going to change things around a little bit, give a little bit different feel. Less of a smiling type of background, more of a serious look. All right, I like what you're doing there, Daniel. I'm going to do a few like this, and then I'm going to move you over to this side. Let's just experiment with using this whiter part here. So let's do the one where you're going to have, let's do the hands in the pockets and one foot back up. I'm kind of leaning back against it just a little bit. All right. Scoot this way just a little bit. I want to leave just a little space by the side of them. All right, that's excellent. Now we're using all the linear qualities of this background, the straight lines, the organized forms, and doing the same thing with him, repeating it all straight forward back towards the camera. Like that. All right, I like that. Look, turn your face that way just a little bit farther. Okay, looking good. All right. Let's change this again. I want to use more of these shapes back here in the wall. Uh, we have a wonderful, heavy textured stone and an old weathered beam over here. So let's see if we can incorporate that into a few more poses. Move back over this way. Dan. I'm not exactly sure what we're going to do to begin with. Um, you know what? Let's try a seated on there first. Uh, and what you might do is just sit with one foot, uh, maybe kind of hooked back underneath the other one. All right. Okay, now that particular pose that we have him in now is not really as strong and forceful as all the shapes that are behind him, so I want to change that a little bit. All right, Daniel, what I want you to do, you're, you've got the back up nice and high. Lean forward on that front foot just a little bit. In fact, bring your foot out to about there. 
What I want to do is elbow to knee like that. That's good. That's real strong. All right, I like that. I'm going to do a vertical shot here using all these straight up and down lines. Daniel, I'm going to have you move your foot that way just a little bit. Keep going that way. That's good. All right, I want you to look that direction a little bit farther. Very good. Very strong. All right, I'm going to move it a little bit closer. I'm going to cut this just at the base of his knee. Very nice. Very soft light, but yet still very sculpturing coming in from the right angle. Turn your face back towards me, Dan, just a little bit farther. All right, that's good. I like that. All right, let's change this again. Let's go back to this far wall. I want to do a few working sideways from an angle here. Uh, perhaps let's try one like that. So we'll do a pose like this. We have one up, one arm up against the wall. I'm always playing with different shapes and angles. I don't always know exactly what I'll do, so I'll experiment and discover body language and get feelings from different juxtapositions of subjects, angles, and background shapes. What we're doing is creating a composition with all these L shapes that are coming at the base of that wall. And then we're sort of re doing a reverse L with Daniel. That's very good. All right, I like that. I tell you what, lean in even farther and we'll bend the elbows. So you can actually hop in towards that just a little bit farther. There you go. I like that. Just a little more relaxed and turn the face back towards me again. Very good. Over this way a little bit and raise your chin just a tiny little bit. Very good. Very strong. All right, I like that. Okay, let me do one where you're going to just fold the arms and lean back against the wall there. All right, I want to get you a little bit sideways that way. Very good. All right, now just turn the face this way down a little bit. Very good. Notice one other thing. This background has very little depth. Uh, normally, you would not say that this has a lot of dimension to it because the subject is right flat up against the background. Something very interesting about the background, though, is that there's almost a painted background effect to it because of the mold and all the things that have, the discoloration that's happened to the wall. So to give it a little more sense of depth, I'm going to bring him over to this far corner where that modeled effect begins to happen on the wall. That's fine, right there. See where that L shape is, right? Okay, now turn your face towards, turn your whole body towards this wall here. Lean against there. All right, now turn your body back towards me a little bit more. Because we're dealing with a lot of very solid and square linear shapes here, you don't want to make him too thin. You want to make those shoulders broader. It gives him a lot of breadth and strength. I like that a lot. Very strong textures in here. It's wonderful. All right, now this would be okay to do a little bit of a smile here because symbolically we have softened this whole thing. It looks good. I like that. All right, gentle guy. You know, you gentle giant guys. Looks real good. Lower your chin just a little bit. All right, that's fine. You know, if you want to, put that hand on your hip. Let's see what that looks like. Okay. All right, looking good. All right, that's great. Let's change it back again. Do both hands on the hips like that. That's real good. So all we're really doing is changing little lines a little bit. We're just creating shapes, triangles, and such, just by placing the arms a little bit differently. That's real good. I want to show you something that's just very different. I want to add a curved shape to a, a scene that has primarily rectangles and squares in it. So I'm going to move Daniel over this way farther, and I'm going to show you the scene from farther back. Nice use of all the lines coming together. Real good, Daniel. Straighten your head up this way just a little bit. That's good. I lied. You can put it back the other way. That's great. All right, turn your face that way. Real strong. Real good. All right, you know the hand that's up on your bicep? Just sort of slide it down a little bit. That's good. All right. You can show a few fingers there instead of the knuckles, so you can just let them, but just kind of pull the hand down inside it. That's good. Very strong light. And that's wonderful light across his face finding the plane of the face and see how the cheekbones go into shadow after that. So it's very strong masculine lighting, very good symbols involved here. All backgrounds are interchangeable for both men and women, depending on the part of the personality that you want to accentuate. Short while ago, we used this same hallway to photograph Daniel. And what we did was a very masculine orientation, using the repeated rectangles of the columns to add strength and power to the portrait. Now we're going to use this same hallway, but look for a more feminine orientation 
and isolate some of those symbols. So we're going to use Kelly again. Kelly. Lean right in towards it. Just lean right in real close. Had a girl. All right. The beautiful curving lines of this gate suggest gracefulness. And even though the color is a dark color and, and the texture is hard, it looks very gentle when we place it against the lighter background. It just has a softer feel, has very easy definition. Kelly, turn your face back this way just a little bit. Very good. All right, right back at me. Just for a second. That's beautiful. We're also isolating a lot of those archways. So we're using the top of the column this time, noticing that there are beautiful, soft, feminine curves there. So just using that part of the picture instead of the rectangular part, you've isolated the feminine symbols. That's beautiful. You know what, Kelly? Turn around and just put your back against there. That's so pretty. Now turn your face back over this way. Great. That's nice. Eyes right about here. Beautiful lady. We'll do it again. Nice, happy face. Look at that girl. That's so pretty. You know, it's very interesting. You're just moving the camera a little bit to the right, and all of a sudden you can see all those repeated rectangles. There is a definite masculine orientation. And if we swing back, you'll see now we're isolating just the soft, rounded areas, and we have a distinct feminine orientation. Very gentle light, the soft pastel colors, the lighter tones coming in from the left help support this feeling of gracefulness, femininity, and gentleness. I'm sure a lot of you have been wondering whether Kelly and Dan ever get together, and the answer is yes. I want to talk to you a little bit about the illusion of third dimensionality in a photograph. This scene that we have here is a very, very gentle scene with light textures and soft shades. It would be quite suitable for either a young man or a young woman, or in this case, both. What makes it stand out is the beautifully receding straight line, which is very masculine, and the slow transition of textures from soft to very soft, which is feminine. Notice how there is some separation in the background tones. When there is very little separation of tones, the background can look very flat, and two-dimensional. Now here's some tips to help create the effect of depth. Number one, separate the subject from the background. If your subjects are flat up against the background, there's nothing to create the illusion of depth. Separating the subject from the background by a distance of, say, 20 feet, maybe even up to 20 yards, will cause the background to drop softly out of focus, separating the subject visually and subduing distracting detail, assuming you are shooting fairly wide open. In this video, we've seen how different the elements of a classical architectural background can be from the elements found in nature. There is generally more solidity of form, more repetition of line and design, and more symbols of a storytelling nature found in an environment such as this. It's precisely the storytelling quality that I find most valuable. A story can draw you in, make you a part of a subject's life and stir the emotion. Imagination is the key ingredient. Start by selecting a background that has a feeling. And that feeling can range anywhere from light and happy to quiet and melancholy. Regardless, with that feeling in mind, imagine, from your subject's point of view, what natural occurrence might happen here. Rely on your own experience. Or perhaps recall from memory a scene from a book or a movie or a play like we did with the photograph of the girl reading the letter by the Romeo and Juliet balcony. So whether your subjects are interacting with the environment, or whether the background is simply a setting where your subjects can interact with each other, always know that an effective background is a powerful contribution to your portrait. Have fun. Use your imagination and know that everything in your viewfinder means something. Happy hunting, and remember, you sincerely look for beauty.